virtually to discuss our shared goal of improving water quality for Wisconsin families. In Wisconsin, water is central to our way of life, whether it's for recreation, work, or for drinking. We have an obligation to keep our water safe and clean. As you know, many families are worried about the safety of their drinking water with the emergence of dangerous chemicals like PFAS. Some are worried because their communities have found chemicals in their drinking water. Others are worried because their communities don't have the resources to even test for them. Many people in our smaller rural communities rely on private groundwater wells and need the resources to help identify any contaminants and then add filtration if contaminants are found. I'm a steadfast believer that everyone should have access to clean drinking water, no matter where they live in our state. That's why I was so proud to introduce the bipartisan Healthy H2O Act to help provide funding for water testing and filtration tools for households, businesses, and community facilities that aren't served by a public water system. Over the past few years, I successfully fought to include millions of dollars for communities like Eau Claire and Wausau for remediation projects to provide safe drinking water to residents. I was also proud to have worked to ensure that the bipartisan infrastructure law made a nearly $7.5 billion investment to help local communities replace dangerous lead service lines and address PFAS contaminants. This funding is reaching Wisconsin communities far and wide to ensure that when families turn on the faucet, they can be confident that safe and PFAS-free water is coming out. With the help of the Citizens Water Group of Wood County, we are making great progress in tackling threats to our water quality and ensuring our communities have access to clean drinking water. I'm proud to be your partner in the U.S. Senate and I look forward to working together to ensure our water is clean for generations to come. Good evening. Anytime a U.S. Senator wants to talk, we just step to the side and let that happen. <laughs> uh, welcome and good evening. It's uh, great to have every one of you here today. I think the first thing I'm going to ask is that you make sure you silence your cell phones. Um, unless you're a neurosurgeon or cardiovascular surgeon that you need to be at the hospital, in the next couple of minutes, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, my name is Lance Plimmel. I am the chairman of the Wood County Board of Supervisors. I also serve as the president and chairman of the board of the Wisconsin Counties Association. Uh, I'm up here today because anybody who's important to this entire process has either been organizing it, working in the back, or they're one of the experts up here speaking today, and I'm here because I can read, and that's about the extent of it. So I want to thank you for the invitation being here today. Uh, our program tonight is brought to you by the Citizens Water Group with the help of the League of Women Voters of the Wisconsin Rapids area and Clean Green Action. Uh, this evening, we're here to examine the topic of the future of clean drinking water in the Central Sands. In a moment, I'll be introducing our uh, esteemed panelists. That'll take place in just a moment, but I have a few housekeeping details I'd like to take care of before that. We anticipate tonight's program is going to last about two hours. Each panelist will make approximately a 15-minute uh, presentation primarily related to nitrates, PFAS, pesticides, finding their way into rural private wells and into municipal systems. All the audience members uh, have been given questionnaire cards by the League of Women Voters and by members of Clean Green Action. While listening to the panelists' presentations, please write out any questions that you may have. At the top of each one of those cards, we'd like you to indicate which panelists you may like to answer that question or who we can direct that to. They asked that none of those questions be more than about three sentences, although I got one up here that looks like it's about three pages. Uh, but three lines would be great. Um, during tonight's presentation, both the League of Women Voters members, as long as those from Clean Green Action, will be going through the aisles to pick up those questions. Our panelist presentations will then be followed by a discussion between our experts, and that'll last about 15 minutes. And we talked in the back room, that's going to be a debate, right? No, it's going to be a discussion. They said they wouldn't argue about whose issue is more important. And then the audience correlated questions will be given to me by the group walking around, and we will respond to those. Uh, we anticipate taking about 10 to 15 minutes this evening to answer those questions. Uh, we did a similar forum about four years ago at Nakusa High School. 
And it's possible that there may be a follow-up to this form as well if there is sufficient interest. At the conclusion of tonight's event, the Citizens Water Group uh, would encourage attendees, if interested, to sign up uh, to become members of that group or the League of Women Voters or Clean Green Action, all of whom meet monthly. And so with that, a really big thank you to the Citizens Water Group for planning and sponsoring this event and the Macmillan Memorial Library for hosting it. Uh, and I guess this is the part you've been waiting for, and I'm going to introduce those esteemed panelists. Uh, first of all, any of you who have had anything to do with water in central Wisconsin for the last a lot of years <laughs> probably know Dr. George Kraft. George Kraft's a groundwater research and outreach hydrologist and professor emeritus of water resources with UW-Stevens Point and UW Extension. His work largely addressed Wisconsin's issue of widespread nitrate and pesticide pollution and how high cap wells are drying up lakes, streams, and wetlands. He has been honored with many prestigious awards that include Wisconsin Ideas Fellow, American Water Research Association's Distinguished Service Award, UW-Stevens Point Outstanding Scholar, and the UW-Stevens Point Outstanding Outreach Person. So uh, one of those people who we've all listened to for many, many years brings a lot to the table. Melissa, we have Melissa Johnson up here. Melissa is the Executive Director of Wisconsin Green Fire a nonprofit group dedicated to conserving and preserving our natural resources through science-based research. Prior to taking the role of Executive Director of Wisconsin Green Fire, she served as a Director of Solid Waste Management for both Marathon and Portage Counties for over two decades. Melissa received her Bachelor Degree in 2000 from the University of Green Bay's Environmental Policy and Planning Program. She lives in Stevens Point and has served on both the City Council and the County Board over in Portage County. Ben Jeffrey. Ben is the Environmental Health Supervisor for Wood County Health Department. He's a registered environmentalist health specialist through the National Environmental Health Association. He completed his degree in biology through UW-Stevens Point. He has been a resident of Wood County for most of his life. And then last but not least, the Honorable Katie Rosenberg. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving on the Local Government Institute Board with Katie, so I see her about once a month in that role. She's currently the Mayor of the City of Wausau. She was elected in 2020, and prior to that, served two terms on the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. She received her bachelor's degree in philosophy, religious studies, and anthropology from UW-Stevens Point, and a master's degree in strategic public relations from George Washington University. So with that, Mr. Kraft, the floor is yours, and look forward to answering your questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Good to be here. So agriculture, it's the main challenge we have to groundwater and drinking water quality in Wisconsin. It's also the, the main challenge we have to surface water in Wisconsin, and not just Wisconsin, it's the entire US. Something is going on and it's not working. I think, I think we, we can agree on that going forward. What I'm gonna do this evening is go through some context quickly on agricultural groundwater challenges and then focus on nitrate pollution because it is the most pervasive contaminant that we have in the state. And then I'm gonna pivot uh, as to why there's been so little progress uh, on, on our water issues here. And then I'm gonna pivot once again and say a few things about what I think it's gonna take for us to do better. Uh, I'm on uncharted ground here. I haven't given this talk before. I've been tossing it around in my head and you're, you're getting the outcome of a brain barf here, I'm afraid. Um, at the outset, let me tell you that this isn't uh, a, a, about trashing farmers, but we have to talk about things. How, how can you talk about anything without understanding causes and effects, right? We have to do this. So our, our groundwater challenge is, if the thing is working right, uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, I've hit all the buttons. I can make the laser work. Well, uh, yes it is. is that, okay. Uh, okay, so do it from there. Go ahead and give me a slide change here. Keep going. Okay, there, there's something, are you on the? Um, there we go, okay. 
Groundwater challenges come in uh, two flavors, groundwater pollution and, and groundwater pumping. Uh, groundwater pumping, which is getting no uh, attention tonight, is when we withdraw so much water out of the ground that we're drying up lakes and streams. And indeed, that was a big problem during a very modestly dry period in the uh, uh, mid to late 2000s. We've got record rainfall since then. The last 10 years have been uh, off the charts here, and that put a mask on the problem, but the problem is still there. Uh, now we've got to do more regular kind of rainfall going on. We're seeing hits to lakes and streams again. Little Plover River's below the public rights flow right now. Uh, a good chance that it's going to dry up and we'll see a fish kill there because we fix nothing in terms of this issue. Groundwater pollution, on the other hand, is what happens. Next slide, please. Well, we have a, a, a source of pollutants on the surface, and that source could be a, a farm field, it could be a, a salt pile, a, a, a septic system, for instance, all these things that might have contaminants associated with a PFAS spill. Um, and then when precipitation goes through that material, it dissolves some of it out and it brings it to groundwater. Uh, and then that contamination moves with groundwater flow from the source to a well or onto a stream where it eventually might end up. Next slide, please. So this is a study, uh, it was completed by our Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection in 2023. They just released it last week and so you're the uh, first people I get to talk to this about it. Uh, hit a click please. Uh, okay, uh, something's wrong but we can work with it. <laughs> no, 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 we can do this. So th the results of the study say that 7.4% of all wells in the state exceed the drinking water standard for nitrate and nitrogen, right? And that's in line with some other ones that suggest that rate is somewhere between 7.4% and 12%. And um, pesticides, 43% of the wells in the state contain at the residue of at least one pesticide. Uh, none of the pesticides, uh, uh, the, the exceedance rate of a drinking water standard of pesticides though is less than 1%. So if you're twitchy about drinking pesticides, you don't care about the standards, well, you'll probably worry about this. If you trust the standard, you go, well, it, it's not too bad. An important thing on um, this graph is that uh, in the DATCAP studies here, down here we have little agriculture, up here, we have a landscape with lots of agriculture, 75%. Fingers crossed, hit it, and let's see what happens. Okay, back up one. We could, we could uh, back up a <laughs> two now, please. <laughs> there we go, thank you. Um, point being here, we can look at nitrate and how when we have little uh, agriculture on the landscape, so we have an agri-urban fringe, we have less than 15% cultivated, the DATCAP study could not find a well that exceeded the nitrate drinking water standard. But now we start getting into 15 to 50%, all the way to 75%, and we start seeing we get lots of wells. 24% in this case on the statewide survey exceed the drinking water standard here. Uh, also note that we pick up pesticide residues, you know, the more agriculture we have, the more uh, pesticides that people are drinking. Next slide, please. Uh, if we zoom in on central Wisconsin here, so this is the nitrate standard exceedance rate, one mile section by one mile section here. The uh, yellow color here is zero to five percent in that section exceed uh, the the standard all the way up to 25% or more in there. So notice, first of all, that we have a huge swath here up and down the uh, Wisconsin Central Sands, irrigated Central Sands here, where we have lots and lots of wells that exceed the, the nitrate standard. Uh, you know, that all this being more than 25%. More than uh, here also we have town of Armenia. I know some people are from Armenia here. Here's the town of Port Edwards too, we see some clustering there. Uh, the town of Strong's Prairie and Adams County as, as well. So we have a lot. The um, pesticide concentrations and exceedance rates are directly tied to what kind of agriculture is going on. 
particular, and the, the highest risks are the potato vegetable agriculture and also continuous corn. These are the ones where you find the highest uh, 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 concentrations and exceedance rates of nitrate. Next slide, please. Uh, just uh, brought out a few towns for people to, to uh, look at here. So you see a lot of towns, uh, the number of wells exceeding the nitrate uh, uh, drinking water standard is, is substantially over 30%, all these uh, in red here. And then some of them are, are over 40%, okay? Uh, it, it's not good. Next slide, please. Uh, not a health guy, so I go by the studies which are quite voluminous uh, in terms of the, the risk that nitrate uh, poses, but the Division of Health recommends that people of all ages avoid long-term consumption of water that exceeds the nitrate standard. And this is not just a Wisconsin thing, this is the U.S. entirely and virtually every first world nation. Uh, in the world, plus, you know, the second and third world nations as well. How does nitrate affect health? Well, most people know about this blue baby syndrome, uh, but beyond that, there are uh, neur neural tube defects, uh, uh, type of birth defect, thyroid disease, and colon cancer are all risks associated with, with nitrate. And there's a lot more available on our state's uh, Division of Health website on it if you're so interested. Next slide, please. Uh, nitrate pollution does economic harm that does not get it factored into the bottom line of the business that's doing the polluting here. Uh, so the cost of fixing Wisconsin home wells uh, is estimated to be at $446 million if everybody was to do that. Currently we have 200 uh, non-community public wells that exceed the nitrate standards, things like churches, restaurants, taverns, campgrounds, gas stations. Uh, all of them are going to be required to upgrade and get rid of the nitrate in their, in, in their system. Uh, beyond that, you know, this past year in the state, 70 non-community uh, public wells replaced their, um, uh, their, their water systems at taxpayer extent, expense. That was a million bucks right there. Uh, it's been estimated that so far municipalities have spent $40 million dollars at, because of high uh, nitrate in their wells. Nearby to me, for instance, there's uh, pullover, whiting, Amherst is messing around. I think it's uh, Junction City or Millador at, as well. This is, this is real cost to real communities. Next slide, please. Uh, what people don't seem to get when I throw out these statistics is that this is hurting real people and real families. So this is Maud and her kids who live in uh, Nelsonville. Maud and the family's been at this Nelsonville home for, for 10 years. I'm going to be reading some of this, some of Maud's story. Um, hit the, uh, the advance one more time, see if we get what I'm after here. No, back her up. Any, uh, t back up two, please. Okay, thank you. If the picture were to come up there, which, which, which it uh, uh, hasn't you'd see that there's a drill rig in the middle of Maud's lawn for three weeks trying to get a new water supply there. Everything is uh, ripped to heck. But anyway, the family moved into this house 10 years ago and found the nitrate was high. They're low income, uh, this family. So for a while, they hauled their drinking water as they didn't have money to put into a, a new well. Later, they installed a Culligan nitrate removal system, which had an upfront cost and that Maud has to lay out $360 a year for, for maintenance on the thing, which, uh, because they are low income, is, is a hurt to their budget. Maud applied for and got a grant paid for taxpayer dollars, not the people that polluted the well, uh, for $16,000 to put it in, and that well is going in right now. She fears, though, that how long will the safe water last because nitrate pollution is going deeper and deeper into the aquifer. Is it going to last a substantial amount of time, or is she going to be out of luck here in a few years again? Next slide, please. Okay, something's wrong. Can you back up three? Let's see what's going on. <laughs> one more. Back up one more. There. Let's talk about Barb. Uh, this is Barb Betro. She's a retiree uh, who is also on disability due to osteoarthritis. Barb moved into an old outer schoolhouse in 1999 and fixed up a simple but lovely home. 
She had nitrate safe water for a number of years, but about a dozen years ago, the field across from her home, it changed ownership and it went from being a corn hay rotation to corn, 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 corn. In the meantime then, she went from having safe nitrate to over 40 parts per million. You cannot treat that water. She hauled for quite some time, um, not happy to have to do it. She asked the farmer who she went to high school with, hey, would you chip in to do something for me? He didn't think that was a good idea. Um, and, and so now this, she has a grant for about $16,000 to get herself a new well. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. That's in Barb's front yard. That's the irrigation rig that went in when the land changed hands. One more, please. This is Mark Brueggemann. Uh, he's a late 70s artist in Nelsonville. He was a caregiver for many years for his wife, Lois, who had severe uh, dementia and she just passed away. His drinking, uh, his nitrate in the drinking water was 10 in 2018. And since then, uh, it's increased over time and now it's over 20 parts per million about the half the time it's, it's tested. He confessed that even with the treatment system he had in his home that he was worried about Lois because with dementia she wouldn't drink from the, um, the treated tap, she would go for anywhere in the house. Uh, Mark is also aligned to get a state grant to pay for this. Next one, please. Uh, this is Patty and Wayne. They're a mid-70s couple uh, who have lived in Scandinavia for almost 40 years. They first had their water tested in the mid-90s and it was safe and then it started rising. In 2003, it was 10.9, uh, rose to 13 by 2014, and it's still on the way up. They have a treatment system on here, but they have uh, too much income to get a state grant for a new well, which is really what they'd like to do. Okay, so this is hurting real people. They're making them incur real costs and undergoing true inconveniences to avoid somebody else's pollution. Next slide, please. So, in the 70s, when I was in my 20s, you could drink water from almost any well in the state and it would have been safe for nitrate, okay? It's about the time that we started seeing nitrate fertilization ramp way the heck up, a uh, trend that, an upward trend that still continues today. And with it, you know, it drove profits, it drove more production, but we're losing more going through the soil, going into groundwater, ending up uh, in people's wells. All the stuff that you may have been hearing about nutrient management and you know, special projects and spoon feeding, yada, 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 it's done very, very little to halt the uh, increase in nitrate pollution. Next slide, please. Ah, thank you, you didn't worry. So uh, th this fellow's name is, is Chris Jones and he's a water resources uh, engineer at University of Iowa. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Swine Republic, and it's about how the agricultural, uh, let's, let's call it the agricultural industry, uh, it's got immense levers, right? It's got a big public relations arms, it owns politicians, it got uh, lobbyists, and, you know, they can bring in uh, uh, BS scientists if they want to, and how, and, it, and it's a case study about Iowa, Nothing has gotten better despite zillions and zillions of dollars getting spent on supposed water quality improvements. Um, a, a case in point here about how powerful the industry is, the legislators in the state capital of Iowa told the University of Iowa, you don't shut this guy up, we're gonna take funding away from your, your university, okay? He's not doing bad science here. They don't like the information. Next slide, please. And this is one of Chris's rallying cries. You know, whenever I go to a, uh, a farm pollution event, it's like, we all want safe water. I'm gonna use an expletive here. Chris says, bullshit, don't say this if you don't mean it. We, you stop saying we all want clean water if you don't really wanna do anything to, to, to make it so. So we, you know, I'm gonna examine here some case studies in Wisconsin about the ag power here. Next slide, please. So, you know, we've all seen these, you know, happy, happy ads, right? We all want clean water. Oh, the, pack, the corn growers support the, the packers and all this. And it makes it look like everything's just great, doesn't it? But, you know, how do you get so many wells with so much pollution in them? Next slide, please. 
Uh, you know, here's an example from Farm Bureau doing what they like, which is to kick people that uh, are clean water advocates here. And this is a, a, an article saying, hey, these are activists, comparing water quality advocates to activist rodents here. Nice. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the potato growers uh, during the water pumping battles here. They, and this is in the Journal Sentinel, uh, they, meaning Lake and Stream advocates, they're untruthful, they're irresponsible, and they're activists. They really like that term there. Uh, we know it, everything is fine. These are lies. Next slide, please. Uh, the potato growers put this book out full of false information. They call it a high capacity well uh, a fact book here. And again, you see a leaked email from their executive director talking about we want to head off the activist pressure here. Next slide, please. Uh, a, a terrible incident in my county here. This fellow, uh, he is elected official uh, from, from one of our towns here. They made him chair of the conservation committee that has a charge, the conservation committee has a charge of cleaning up the water and protecting the soil. What did he do instead? Concerned citizens went to him, he bullied them, he allowed pro-farm anti-water uh, falsehoods to be said, he invited a hoaxer uh, just to put out a whole bunch of false information. Uh, and the one that really got me, he harassed a very fine county employee, he and others on this committee, until she left her job two weeks ago. Next slide, please. This is her, by the way, getting uh, uh, an award after she left her job from her professional organization, the great work she did. This is what we lost in Portage County. Next slide, please. Okay, and I don't want to keep Lisa too long. It could be dangerous to my health. <laughs> so uh, what will it take to improve our water? So one of these quotes is from uh, a water scientist friend of mine and the other from a farmer friend of mine is we've had little improvement in water quality and agricultural watersheds. There's little incentive, like money, uh, or disincentive, like regulation, to adopt the practices needed. So a good explanation of why we've made no progress on this over decades. The second one, uh, a farmer friend of mine says, farmers can fix this. And this is a guy who genuinely wants to. We need to advocate for changes to the farm bill that reward clean water performance over, over increased production. So what I want to suggest um, is that if you know, you're a, a, a water advocate, you know, let's find some people in the agricultural community that share that second sentiment here. And, and the ones that don't, with all the Christian kindness in your heart, you, know, you have to say, no, you have your facts wrong. You are responsible for most of the pollution in, uh, of, of, of our state's groundwater and drinking water, and let's see what we can do to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kraft, and you can always find him if you need any questions answered. He's everywhere that water is a concern. Uh, next up, Melissa Johnson. Melissa with Wisconsin Green Fire. The podium is yours. Yes, I'm short. Um, so if you can't see me, I'm here. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. And thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Clean Water Coalition, or I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Thank you very much for inviting me to attend here. Um, it's my honor to present some information on PFAS. Um, but before I do that, I wanna thank Wisconsin Green Fire members who are here, and I know there are a number of them. Would you please raise your hand and be recognized? Yeah, it's an amazing group. Thank you for your support. I couldn't do this job without you. We cannot do this job of science-based advocacy for conservation and environmental protection without you. Thank you. Ooh, is it up? There we go. Um, I first was introduced to PFAS, I think it was two, summer of 2000 or spring of 2018. And as Lance indicated, I ran the Marathon County Solid Waste Department from, well, I ran two solid waste departments, so basically landfills. Landfills have liquid that percolate through them, both from the waste mass and then on snow melt and then rainwater. That water is collected at the bottom of landfills, it's pumped out, it's taken to a wastewater treatment facility. 
um, for treatment. In Marathon County, we sent it to Domtar Paper Mill, just down the road, about 12 miles from us, and they brought it through their wastewater treatment facility, and it was kind of a win-win. The leachate was high in nitrogen. It helped to break down the lignin in their papermaking process so that they could meet their effluent limits. I got a letter from a lawyer who has now become a friend and a Green Fire member, um, who, and the letter said, Dear Director Johnson, Domtar will no longer take your leachate because we fear it has PFAS in it and we don't want to pump PFAS out into the Wisconsin River and uh, be liable for the damage for future um, lawsuits. And within a couple of months, I had to find a location for the leachate because we produced about 18 million gallons a year. Um, and that was my first introduction to PFAS. Never heard of it before, and I learned really quickly. PFAS are frequently called the forever chemical, and I'm not sure I really like that term, but it's, it's, a, it's in the vernacular and we'll stick with it. Next slide. I found this quote by Byron, and it's almost like he was a precursor to you don't know what you got till it's gone. Um, till taught by pain, men know not water's worth. And I think that's what we're talking about this evening. Water's all around us, and we think we take it for granted in the upper Midwest, right? I remember when I was in college, my professor, George, uh, what was his, not George Kraft, what was his first name? Another Kraft, Mike Kraft. Um, he was working on the cleanup project in the Bay of Green Bay in the Fox Valley. And he said, the upper Midwest will be the battleground for clean water in the future because we have such an abundant amount of it, but we take it for granted. We flush our toilets, we pollute, we do all sorts of things. Um, we don't know what it's got, we got till it's gone. And of course, Jacques Cousteau's quote on the water cycle being basically life. I was listening to a presentation by an, an indigenous voice um, and it was interesting. He went through a number of different things. It was a great webinar and he said, I'm frequently asked what the indigenous name for natural resources is. He said, we don't have one. Natural resources are life. Water is life. Next. We humans do a really, 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 really good job of messing things up. About 80,000 chemicals that have been synthesized since World War II because we can. We have labs, we have really smart people. Some of those chemicals are really useful. Some of them, not so much. Um, about 1,500 a year are actually classified um, and they go through a process. Some of them are never used, they're just sort of cataloged, but that's still a huge amount of chemicals that are out in the environment. Next. So then we come to PFAS, per and polyfluoral fluorinated alkyls. I can never say it properly. It is a category, well, it used to be when I made this about a year ago, it was about 10,000 man-made chemicals. Some are saying now it's closer to 14,000 chemicals. They are perfect for repelling stains, repelling oil, repelling water, for putting out a fire. And in fact, I, on Saturday, I went shopping for a, a new sofa or a new chair, an easy chair, and in the furniture store, they had this fake can of soda laying across the, the furniture, showing that this is stain repellent. And I said to the woman, I'm looking for something a little bit darker color because I got a dog and it's gonna jump on it. And she goes, oh, don't worry, it's stain repellent. And my daughter was with me and she goes, now she's gonna start talking about PFAS. <laughs> And I did, I lectured the woman on PFAS. So, um, we, we love them. They make our lives easier um, and we're all culpable in a lot of ways because we desire the products of stain resistance, repelling oil, putting out a complex fire. Next. These are some of the sources of PFAS in our lives. I remember one of the first WISPAC meetings I went to, and that was Governor Evers' uh, Council on PFAS. He had all the administrative agencies around a table. We were at DNR offices in Madison, 
And each one of the administrative agencies, the representative, and I was there on behalf of the solid waste industry, we were being blamed for PFAS because we take in your garbage and your garbage has PFAS, so we were the bad guys. That made me mad. Um, and so I started attending these meetings and everybody was going around the table talking about, this is terrible, they need to do something about this. And, and it's true. And I finally got, a, the public had a chance to speak and I got up and I said, how many of you today are wearing all day makeup? And the look on people's faces, the women, I, there may have been some men wearing all day makeup, I don't know. Anyway, the women were like, why do you ask? And I said, because if you got all day mascara on, you just coated your eyes with PFAS. How many of you have outer, or outdoor gear that is rain resistant? And a few people, well, yeah, I do. I know. This, is, this is where PFAS it are in our lives. They're, they're everywhere. Now, many manufacturers are phasing them out, but they're in solar panels. I went in to have my bike fixed, and they were going to put um, Teflon oil on my um, chain, and I nearly jumped over the <laughs> little thing, and I said, if you do that, Todd, I'm going to kill you. And he said, no, I won't. So these are some of the places we find PFAS. Next. And unfortunately, in our food supply, and yes, in our drug supply. Now, don't stop taking your Lipitor or your Prozac. What we're finding with uh, pharmaceuticals, it's a one carbon, one fluorine chain. So it is not an, an incredibly problematic PFAS, and that's the thing. The longer the carbon fluorine chain, up to 12 chains, the more dangerous it is. So in pharmaceuticals, it's pretty well understood. This is one carbon, one fluorine. Our food supply, if food is grown in fields where uh, PFAS are residing in the soils, they will uptake it. Now you can have pristine soil because we have rain deposition that will contain PFAS. So despite our best efforts, it may be in our food supply. And in fact, my colleagues at UWSP, I used to be adjunct faculty there, they are working on a project that's funded and they're looking at large swath of, swaths of land that are contaminated with PFAS and looking for opportunities instead of declaring them Superfund sites. The town of Stella, if you're familiar with it, in Oneida County has become a large uh, site where soils are incredibly contaminated they're looking at could we remediate those soils rather than removing you know, acres and acres up to 12 uh, inches deep and sending them to a landfill, can they grow a crop that will uptake those PFAS? They're looking at both cannabis and alfalfa because both have really good uptake and then harvesting that material and then sending that off to the landfill. The idea is, is that it will reduce the concentration of PFAS in the soil we'll see how successful they are. Go ahead. I am not a toxicologist. In fact, I am not a scientist. I usually start my presentations, I'm not a scientist. I'm a public policy wonk. Um, but I have a job in the world of science and I get to work with the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. Um, this is from, uh, as you can see, the Department, our National Institute of Health. There are some suspected and known health issues related to consumption of certain PFAS. Again, 10 to 15,000 of these chemicals, some of them short chain, some of them long chain, not all of them have the same level of danger in your intake. But it's good to be aware that the, this can happen. Go ahead, next. And this is the PFAS cycle, and I know that looks complicated because it is. What this demonstrates is that everybody in this system, households, consumers, farmers, wastewater treatment plants, landfills, industrial production, we all play a role in the PFAS cycle. You decide to buy something, let's say a Teflon pan. You use it for years, now you find out it has PFAS. Teflon is a PFAS, by the way. And you go, I want to get it out of my house. Where do you, what do you do with it? You put it in the landfill, right? So you play a role because your consumer choice is you bought a pan probably because it was inexpensive and you didn't realize the potential danger. Now you discard it, now the landfill is part of the cycle. 
the landfill has water percolating through it, as I indicated. That's taken to a wastewater treatment facility. It is treated there, and it may or may not successfully treat for PFAS. In other words, remove PFAS from the effluent. And currently, it is not a, a regulated entity. So your discharge goes out to your surface waters, and that cycle just kind of keeps moving around. Next. Currently in Wisconsin, we do have drinking water standards. We have a 70 parts per trillion, as you can see, for PFOA, PFOS. I'm not going to try and pronounce those. Um, maybe after a few drinks, I can try it, and then it would work out. But 70 parts per trillion, no, par parts per trillion, one part per trillion is equal to one drop in 20 Olympic-sized pools. There are only a few labs in Wisconsin, the State Hygiene Lab, um, Northern Lakes Lab, and Crandon, that can actually test to that minute amount of concentration. So these two are long chain, um, what we call legacy PFAS. They're no longer in production in the United States. They are still produced in other countries. So if you're importing some gear that is uh, uh, rain resistant or oil resistant, it may still contain some of those long chain PFAS. So those are the two most studied, most regulated PFAS. We do have a drinking water standard for those two. Next. This is from Wisconsin's Green Fire Opportunity Now 2.0. Um, we have a genius uh, statistician working for us, a volunteer, his name is Jim Bauman. He collected all the data that has been um, gathered by the state, and he did some analysis and built this chart. Right now, um, and again, prior to about 2020, we didn't have a lot of data. Nobody was testing for PFAS. Again, 2018, I didn't know about it. I'm fairly well informed. So this started coming onto the scene. What we're seeing is of the municipal wells that have been tested, again, what I'm saying here is there are only 7.6% that are exceeding the EPA's MCL, and that's a mi minimum contaminant levels. Well, that isn't a whole lot what one needs to know. So for the most part, drinking water is fairly safe in Wisconsin from PFAS. However, communities that are impacted, my dear friend Katie, are impacted significantly, horrifically. So. That number may look small, but the impacts to those communities are beyond the scope of imagination and trying to figure out what to do to keep people safe. Next. And this is from the DNR's website. It's showing central Wisconsin sampling uh, from municipal water systems. No private um, water systems are, are shown here, nor are the non-municipal um, public water systems shown here, just the public our municipal water systems. As you can see, there's a big old dot in Wausau, a couple of them. Um, and you can see, for the most part, we do have a lot of dots demonstrating that there have been sampling, but any DTECs are far below any of the MCLs or the 70 parts per trillion. Next. <coughs> our surface water standards, as you can see, for PFOS, eight parts per trillion. Um, and for PFOA is 20 parts per trillion. That is for surface waters that contribute to a drinking water supply, a municipal drinking water supply. If there are exceedances, as my friend Katie Rosenberg knows, then you have to implement corrective actions, and that usually includes granulated activated carbon systems, that's a filtration system, along with either remote, reverse osmosis and or it could include an ion resin exchange. I will not steal Katie's thunder on the cost of those. She can share those jaw-dropping jaw numbers with you. Next. This is uh, showing the uh, fish consumption uh, advisories along the Wisconsin River, except uh, the area that is going off to would be my left on, in Wausau, that's the Rip River. And those are all the fish consumption um, advisories along the Wisconsin River and the Rib River. Now, I did this presentation the other day, and people are going, oh my gosh, I fish there all the time. If you're going to be eating fish from those areas, please follow the DNR's consumption, or Department of Health Services consumption advisory. 
or catch and release, which is equally as fun, right? So next. Groundwater standards, biosolids standards, and remedial action standards. That is a big zip. Zero. Nada. The DNR worked for quite a while on groundwater standards, which were rejected by the Legislative's Joint um, Rules Committee, saying it would be too expensive to implement. They went back to the uh, drawing board on that. We still don't have groundwater standards. Now, if you're drinking your water from a private well, I'm sorry, but we don't have anything to advise you on that. You can use the drinking water standards. You can have your water tested. And if you see it's beyond those MCLs and the um, uh, standards, you certainly can employ um, getting another source of water or installing your own treatment system. And this is where we get into a little bit of social and economic justice issues. A whole house reverse osmosis system is about eight to $10,000. If you're a household on uh, fairly low income, fixed uh, income, and maybe you gotta have a new transmission so you can get to work, or the kids need braces, or whatever the case, you may not be able to protect your family because you cannot afford the cost of a treatment system in your home. Biosolids are the wastewater um, solids out of both industrial and municipal wastewater. Um, municipal wastewater uh, biosolids and uh, some paper mill biosolids are spread on fields for um, soil nutrient and soil uh, supplement. It is not illegal, it is done under permit. However, we're starting to question whether and when biosolids should be allowed to be applied onto land. Um, Michigan is looking at what they're calling industrially impacted PFAS biosolids. Those are being prohibited from uh, land uh, application and now must go to landfills. We don't quite have that yet in Wisconsin and we have no remedial action standards. So if you have a contaminated site and actually the DNR just lost um, a lawsuit to Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, DNR wanted to try and enforce cleanup standards for PFOA, PFOS. And in fact, because there were no standards, the courts ruled that the DNR was outside their jurisdiction to allow, uh, to force cleanup for PFOA and PFOS. Next. So what can we do? <laughs> I feel like that most days. <laughs> I, I swear to God, I, you, you just go, ah, you listen to the news, you just, uh, that's the way we feel. Next slide. When I was working in solid waste, we had um, a hotline, a toll-free number for people who had questions about waste reduction, composting, and, and recycling. I always told my staff, when you're answering the phone, the answer is never no. We'd get calls, what do I do with uh, plastic bags? What do I do with paper egg cartons? Hey, I've got some old dynamite, can I put that in the garbage? <laughs> true story, true story. Um, the answer is never no. I always wanted my staff to be able to provide to the public that we served with solutions. If we didn't have immediate answers, what we did was, let me see if I can get you a resource. And, and by the way, we did manage to get a resource called the Bomb Squad on the, um, on the dynamite. Look for cre in our credible sources of information. These are really good sources. They're not perfect. This is, Lance said something about you know, the expert panel here. I don't think anyone can be an expert on PFAS. This is such a complicated topic. This is changing all the time. We're learning more, we're researching more, we're beginning to understand the fate and transport of PFAS in soil, the fate and transport of PFAS in leachate. We just don't know. So these are credible sources today. I find them useful, they're not perfect. Now BPI is bio, our Biodegradable Product Institute. If you're looking for a PFAS free or free or um, free from fluorine um, products, uh, disposable paper plates and disposable dinnerware, let's say you're doing a big event and you want to compost it, BPI has a really good list of those that would be considered PFAS free. Um, environmental Working Group, their Skin Deep, will help you find some um, cosmetics that will be PFAS free or low in PFAS. And the Green Science Policy Institute also provides some good information. Next. Don't be fooled. When this commercial came on the air, 
and I found it online then. My daughter said, oh my God, she's gonna scream at the TV, and I did. <laughs> so don't be fooled, don't buy that ceramic pan. That ceramic pan is perfectly safe, honestly. That hex clad though, yes, hex clad. It's PFOA free, yes ma'am, yes sir. The non-stick PTFE coating. Don't be fooled. Ask questions. Be a smart consumer. Next. Be a consumer advocate. I was doing a presentation at Wausau West, um, oh, maybe 10 years ago, on waste reduction and how environmental policy impacts waste management. And one of the students raised his hand after I talked for about an hour, and I think he was bored, but he said, well, I'm just a kid. What can I do? I don't have any power. And I said, do you have a job? Well, yeah, I have two jobs. Holy smokes. I said, do you know that you have all kinds of power? Consumers have trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of power. When parents found out that BPA was in their baby's bottles, what happened? Uh. Yeah, parents got pissed. We don't want BPA in our baby's bottle and we will not use a bottle that has BPA in it. Guess what happened? Manufacturers quit using BPA. Consumers have trillions of dollars of power. Use it. Next. And I have to do a shameless plug because that's my job. Wisconsin's Green Fire. We like to say that we think like mountains so we can do the science to preserve and protect our natural world and all who reside there. Um, it really is an amazing group. I've only been with them since November 1st as their executive director. I really encourage you to check us out. Um, and Carolyn, raise your hand. Carolyn has these. We have some free seeds for you. These are native wildflowers. That's our gift from Wisconsin's Green Fire to all here. Carolyn would be happy to give you a packet. Um, next. And if you want to get a hold of us or contact me and yell at me after this, please feel free to do so. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And I think the pressing question is, did you buy that couch or? <laughs> I knew that's what everybody was waiting to hear, so. I did. Appreciate, appreciate <laughs> you being here, and they do a great job. And I know all these panelists will be here later to answer those questions. Next up, Ben Jeffries. Ben is our environmental health supervisor from the Wood County Health Department, the only one that myself and a couple other supervisors in here have any control over. So Ben? <laughs> you better get to it then. No problem, take your time. All right, I'm Ben Jeffrey, Wood County Environmental Health Supervisor. So I'm just gonna give a um, kind of a brief overview of environmental health, um, what it is, uh, and then some snapshots at a local level as far as nitrates and PFAS goes, hopefully some useful information um, that you can use moving forward. Um, so you can go to the next slide. <laughs> I actually made 10 of these slides, it was just a joke. But no, <laughs> there it is. Um, it's funny, so funny. there's our um, environmental health specialist. So we actually cover Wood, Adams, and Juno. So if anyone's a uh, licensed business owner, you may recognize some of the faces here. Um, what I really wanna s let you know is you have a resource here, um, local, Wood County. These folks have been if not on your road, probably a block over. Um, we inspect all licensed food establishments, um, lodging, Airbnbs, campgrounds, hotels. So um, they're very familiar with the area. Um, we've done uh, sampling projects, water sampling. Um, so everyone's used to working with the public. And if you have a problem or an issue, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, we, can, we can definitely help you out with that. So next slide.
So as I mentioned, we do a lot of the licensed food establishment inspections. Um, so this is a short list of all the codes that we are responsible for knowing. Um, the food code is right around 300 pages or a little bit more of uh, fun de details on how to um, serve food safely. Uh, we also do lodging, hotels, camps, Airbnbs. Um, just in Adams County alone this last year, uh, we had over 150 new Airbnbs to keep up with on, on licensing. So um, it's becoming very popular uh, around the lakes area. Um, we have a uh, mobile home community code that, that we also um, enforce with, with the mobile home communities. And then we do some work with um, tenant landlord situations, usually under the public health ordinance, which you'll see on the next slide if you could go. So this is the um, public health ordinance definition of a human health hazard. Um, so if you're wondering where we start getting into the groundwater, this is it. Um, uh, it defines a human health hazard. And if you can go to the next slide, um, you'll see a, a list of all the, the human health hazards as defined in the ordinance. So yeah, that's a fun one. So um, anywhere from accumulations of manure, rubbish, garbage, refuse, I won't go down all of them, but it's a, it's a wide variety of, of things that can basically um, cause acute or chronic illness over time. So that's the pollution of any well, groundwater, aquifer, that's where we, we start getting involved um, when there's pollution and um, with things like nitrate, bacteria, and now PFAS and pesticides. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So we are agents for the DNR um, in Wood, Adams, and Juneau. Um, what that means is we're not only doing the inspections for a lot of these licensed food establishments, but we're our, all, also sampling their water. Um, so TNCs are wells that serve over 25 people 60 days out of the year or more. Um, so these include bars, churches, um, campgrounds, and we test them for bacteria and nitrate. Um, we also go to each one that are seasonal. So like your campgrounds that start up and we'll take a startup sample to make sure that there's safe drinking water being served through that season. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so we started our own nit nitrate and bacteria lab um, around 2018. So it's pretty nice. We can just take those samples, go back and run them at our own lab. Um, so there's Logan Monty, our lab specialist um, running some bacteria and some nitrate on the far right. Um, so we're certified through DATCAP for bacteria. So every three years, we, they, they come by and do an audit of, of our lab, make sure we're, we're following their code. Um, and then the nitrates, same thing, we're certified through the DNR with that. Um, so the nitrate health impacts were kind of covered uh, before, so we can go to the next slide. and. So um, this is going to be your local um, kind of snapshot of what we're finding in the area. Um, so since uh, we started sampling in, in 2018, this is kind of the snapshot over the last three years. Um, so these are percent of tested wells over 10 parts per million. Um, so as Dr. Kraft kind of showed that, that great map with um, all, the, all the high percentages for testing over that, those 10, that 10 parts per million, um, we're kind of seeing that, that same thing around here. So um, we have Wood, Juno, and Adams all above the state average of 10% um, of wells having over that 10 parts per million. So this is uh, really an illustration of us being in sandy soils, um, you know, the, the higher contamination rates, the susceptibility to um, the the nitrate pollution. So um, based off of this, uh, we um, did a, also a targeted sampling approach um, as what was mentioned before with the Armenia Growers Coalition. So the, the AGC corridor uh, west of Petenwell, the southern um, most of Wood County and kind of that northern um, Juneau County area surrounded by agricultural land use. And you can go to the next slide. Um, this is an illustration of kind of what we found through our lab there. 
So over over 30 percent uh, of those wells tested over uh, 10 parts per million that that contamination limit set by um, the state. So this really shows uh, the land use um, having a, a direct effect on um, the high susceptibility of those those wells. Most of these wells are are shallow. They're point driven. Um, they're highly susceptible to that quick filtration of groundwater that um, brings down the excess nitrates. So uh, you can go to the next slide. This is kind of um, just a summary. Um, so just to be aware that if you haven't tested your well, uh, you come on and get it tested. Uh, we, we recommend at least once a year uh, for nitrates. Nitrates do fluctuate. We found they can be high in the spring after, after high rain events. Um, they can fluctuate lower during the summer when um, rain slows and then sometimes high again uh, in the fall. So um, it's, it's good to get at least, at least one test on the books and, and kind of see any trends go from there. So uh, you can go next slide. Um, so kind of transitioning from um, nitrates locally, as I mentioned, a lot of land use. Um, so that, that does translate to PFAS um, pretty directly. Um, here we have the health impacts that, that we kind of covered already. Um, <coughs> basically, the forever chemical that, that changes kind of your body makeup if, as, as it um, increases. So... You can go to next slide. Um, so some information for you, maybe some silver lining as a private well owner. Um, this was the DNR study done on shallow wells, uh, wells less than 40 feet throughout the state of Wisconsin. So they did, um, conducted a, a grid pattern across the state and sampled um, sampled the shallow groundwaters for PFAS. Um, although 71% of those samples came back detect, um, there is actually less than 1% of those um, shallow wells that came back higher than um, that maximum contamin cam contamination limit set by EPA, excuse me, um, of the four parts per trillion. So um, the typically the wells um, that came back with the high um, PFAS were directly related to land use. Um, not, not necessarily agricultural, um, but land, land spreading, um, and in some cases, land spreading of, of um, human waste products within there. So uh, you can go next slide. So should you test? Um, as far as PFAS goes, it's pretty, pretty rare in the residential well. Um, but if you are worried or would like to know if you should test, um, the DNR does have that, that GIS map up, so you can at least see if there's a nearby um, cause for concern. Um, most municipalities in Wood, Adams, and Juneau all tested under the 70 parts per trillion. Um, there were a couple. Uh, one in Marshfield, I believe, but um, they've been they've been taken off, and now all, all municipal water is is below that um, that level of concern. So, um, if you have any questions on this, feel free to reach out. We can kind of help do some of the technical things as well, and, and give you some answers on that. So, uh, you can go to the next slide. So, as mentioned before, testing is is pretty expensive. Um, Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene uh, does does offer it. We were there. Um, I think the machine is very expensive, but that's probably why why the tests are very timely and and cost quite a bit. So um, again, kind of a, a risk analysis. If if you want to test, uh, we can kind of help figure out the details on that for you. So next slide. Good news, there is treatment, um, pretty similar to nitrate treatment actually we're finding. Um, residential single point RO systems can be used for, for drinking water. The upkeep is a little bit more um, on the filter um, 
getting new filters maybe twice a year. Um, typically, the cost for upkeep is right around two to three hundred dollars a year, um, similar to to nitrate. And then you have the activated carbon as well. Um, ion exchange uh, is typically used for nitrate whole house as well. Um, I'm not sure on the details as far as PFAS goes, but um, yeah. yeah. So uh, next slide. So that's our building river block and our contact information. Um, again, if you have any questions or have a, a sp specific problem, um, we're not Google, but we can get you in the right direction. So, all right, thank you. Thanks, Ben. That's Ben Jeffrey, our Wood County Health Department. Katie Rosenberg, Mayor of Wausau, who's been on the front lines dealing with this, spending a few dollars. It's a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure kind of deal we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, Katie really has been at the forefront on the PFAS issue. So, Katie, please. I'm just as short as Melissa, so <laughs> this is where we'll be. That's all right. You can probably skip through the first one, two slides once you get it up. Let's say you had a friend that lived in Washera County. Where would they get testing for nitrates done? They could come here. Oh, okay, good. I'm going to send them to you. Yeah. <laughs> I was Otherwise texting my friend. Yeah, there's also a list of labs online. Okay. So certified that we'd be able to figure something out. Awesome. Do you want to move the mic down? The other thing while they're getting Katie's slides up, if you have some questions and you've written those down on those cards, if you can get them to us up or to Bill Lightning in the back, we'll get those up here and try to answer some of those questions. We'll try to collate these as we pull them together. Awesome. You can skip this one and the next one. You already know who I am. But that's our old drinking water treatment facility. Have I given you something that's corrupted? <laughs> okay, awesome. We need to get that too. Hi, that's my city. It's a great photo too. Yeah, I have a new one. It's been five years since I took that one. I've got a lot more gray hair and wrinkles now. <laughs> What did you want? I, well, I just need you to go to the next slide. Sorry, I thought that was... All right, here we are, my timeline here. So uh, in the spring of 2019, um, the team at Wausau, I wasn't yet there, I was on the county board at the time, um, decided we need a new drinking water treatment facility and upgrades to our wastewater treatment facility. So they did some testing. Um, there really wasn't much of a, um, a standard yet. Um, they tested, they had a little bit, it didn't, it didn't it wasn't a blip on anybody's radar at that point, um, but we did have some results at that point um, that were never reported. I don't know what happened, um, but it happened. Um, and then in when I was elected, so in 2020, you know, we had COVID, uh, we started construction on the new um, treatment facilities, and um, you know, we we were focused on uh, getting those new things online. And uh, PFAS again, um, when Melissa says she didn't hear about them until. Uh, 2018. I had heard about them maybe in 2021, um, but then at the be at the end of 2021 uh, was when the DNR came to me um, and our team, and they said, "Hey, Rib Mountain just tested positive. They're right next door to us. Uh, they had a really hot well. It was like 130 parts per trillion. Um, would you test all of your drinking water wells um, just so we can see how far this contamination is?" Um, so we decided to go ahead and do that. And then at the end of January, um, after testing all six wells, uh, we had contamination in every single well. 
and that meant anywhere from 20 parts per trillion to 50 parts per trillion, um, which you'll recognize the standard for Wisconsin right now is 70. So that set us up for some really bombastic conversations. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, I can show you some of uh, what happened. Yep. So we had every single well. I had to hold a press conference. Um, I had some help from my friends in state. Um, you know, they put me through what they called a murder panel of all the questions I would be asked by reporters. Um, and interestingly, I was asked maybe a quarter of those questions. So if you're a reporter out there, uh, there's still more questions I would be able to answer for you. Um, but again, this, this was politically hot. And um, the next week after our press conference, I was like, oh, the DNR is holding a um, an, you know, comment session. They're talking about this PFAS standard. I have a story to tell. I want to talk about what we're going through. This is hell. And so I did. And of course, the uh, DNR board member from Wausau um, went ahead. And this was something new to me. Um, I'm used to a little bit more decorum uh, being in local government where uh, there's a public hearing. Uh, the people sitting on the board don't typically say anything back to you. They listen. They take notes. And when it is their turn to discuss policy, they discuss it among each other. Well, that's not how this worked. Um, this guy uh, interrupted me, asked me a bunch of questions, told me I was hysterical. Um, so it was really, it was awful. Um, and it was a little bit sexist. Um, so we, uh, I didn't, again, I did not sleep at all uh, that month. Um, and I had to figure out what the heck to do. Luckily, we had Melissa working for the county and I could call her and cry um, or text her late at night. So thank you for that. Um, and so I basically had to tell her story uh, across the board. Um, and I was lucky that at a certain point, this looks like the set, that third story is from May. So at that point, we had been talking about temporary solutions. Um, we were in the process still of building our new drinking water treatment facility. It wasn't online. We had some temporary solutions. Uh, there was a company out of Michigan, I think, who said, hey, we can bring you granular activated carbons. They, you can just attach them, hook them up to your plant, and you'll be able to filter every single water. And I was like, that's great. That sounds equitable. I love this. So we invited them in. They were doing some testing. And my um, utility director was like, uh, I got some bad news. Um, you know, Wasa is 150 years old. And our pipes are just as old. And so if we were to put this temporary solution on, uh, that seems like a good answer, um, it could release some of our anti-corrosion um, treatments and we could end up with something like Flint. And I was like, we are not ending up like with something like Flint. But it was really hard because what are we gonna do in the meantime? So we ordered a bunch of um, temporary filters, uh, like pitchers from Zero Water. You know, There's a lot of different resources on the Department of Health <laughs> Services website where they tell you, these uh, companies claim uh, to have PFAS removing treatments, and here, look at these. And so we did that, um, and we did zero water, uh, and handed, I don't know, maybe about 6,000 out to Wasa water users. We had bottled water, um, we had all that stuff. So uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. <laughs> so obviously, politics uh, played into this deeply, um, and so I like to kind of partition it out into, there were really good politics. Um, I was able to open my mouth and get attention of our senator. Thank you. Um, she, I know she has her staff here today. Um, she was very helpful in kind of helping um, kind of work through the issue. Um, I also got in touch with folks at the DNR. Uh, my legislators showed up. Um, I have a lot of new friends who are in interest organizations. Um, I have a lot of friends who I was terrified at first. We actually had somebody from, oh my gosh, what is her name? Uh, Erin Brockovich, someone from her team reached out and I was like, oh no, do not, please, I'm already going through so much. Um, but she's got a water master out of California who works with her. And so we had some long conversations and now we're LinkedIn buddies. Um, you know, obviously necessary politics. Our city council had to hash through, and our utility commission had to hash through some of this stuff in ways that we had never talked about, you know, PFAS before. We just hadn't, and not as a community. Um, so that was, it felt hard and difficult to have those conversations. Um, we were still learning the science while we were also trying to make decisions on this. So that that was awful, um, but it was necessary and we, we got it done. Um, and then of course the terrible politics, I have a little radio station there, but so you can probably guess why, but um, there were a lot of kind of politically motivated folks who really wanted to uh, attack me for this. Um, and you know, I definitely didn't go into my city walls and like inject it with PFAS. So it, it wasn't my fault, but they're bantering about the science, you know, the standard kind of standing up for this. So um, 
there was a lot of politics, some of it good, a lot of it bad, um, a lot of it necessary. So if you want to go to the next one, we're going to return to the timeline. So in March, we identified our, our alternative water sources. There are pictures. Um, finally, in December of 2022, I mean, that year, 2022, felt like it lasted 10 years for me um, mm -hmm. and probably for all of us. But our new facility went online. Um, it Again, we weren't planning to have PFAS filtration. It wasn't an issue that we were concerned about. We were concerned about other things, other water quality issues. Um, so we had a temporary solution that is still in effect right now where we have an anionic exchange and we put a special PFAS uh, collecting resin in there. Um, and it's working really well. Um, every time we uh, have it refreshed or um, recharged, it gets us back down to zero parts per trillion. Um, which we're really excited about. But it's a million dollars every time we have to replace that resin. And we, based on our pilot testing, and also we've refreshed it already one time, um, and we need to do that about every 12 months or less. So that's expensive to maintain, and we can't do that. So in 2023 um, there, we came up with a, a permanent solution. What are we going to do here? Um, so we came up with granular activated carbon. You know, I talked to researchers out of uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. They've got great water uh, people. They're amazing. Um, and, you know, we talked through all of the things. There's a well in Dane County where they're testing um, with using bacteria, which is really kind of exciting because it can eat it and digest it, and you don't have to worry so much about what to do with the after effects. Um, I know there's a scientist out of Portage County uh, who's been doing some testing with... Um, mushrooms and remediation there. It's really exciting. Um, but these researchers are like, you know, this is all awesome. I'm really excited that you care about science. But if, you, if I were you, I'd be focused on granular activated carbon. It's long term. Um, it's probably the most well studied and it's going to get the job done for you. So that's kind of the direction we went. And we are building that right now uh, because of our weird winter. We're pretty ahead of schedule, I think, um, you know, based on what supplies we have available. We're building 12 different vessels. You can see little pictures of them down there. Um, and each of those vessels, so that they're partnered up. So there's six teams. We've got a lead system and a lag system. I'm, gonna, I'm telling you the basics. Uh, if you want to know all, more about this, please come visit our drinking water treatment facility. Uh, you can nerd out with all of the people there. But basically, so the lead vessel, the water goes in and it takes out all the PFAS and then it goes through this leg vessel and the PFAS are gone, but it's still going through. But once it breaks through in that lead vessel, the leg will keep it up and uh, will still continue to have um, PFAS free water. So that's the goal. Um, and it's also taking out some other stuff, you know, like other kinds of carbon and different things that it can suck out, um, which is complicated when we're treating water for other things. If you're a water person, you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of stuff that we do there. And water chemistry is very different um, depending on where you are and where your source is. You know, we were talking about sandy soil here. We have like glacier stuff and it's very different. Um, but that's what we're doing now. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, it's a little bit even nerdier. So we have our, our short-term strategy here. Um, we're using that ion exchange. Um, yeah, it looks, we're right on schedule here, uh, although maybe not quite uh, January 2024 or later. So it will be later. It'll be at the end of this year that we're good. But we can move on to the next slide. I just want to shout out our critical partners. There we are with our friends of the DNR. Um, there we are with uh, our Senator Baldwin. The reason she was such a critical partner is that once we started talking, she encouraged, her staff encouraged us to apply for a congressionally directed uh, spending request, which is a fancy term that for earmarks. And uh, of course, I was like, all right, we're going to apply $20 million. And they said, all right, we're going to accept your earmark request, but we're going to have to talk you down. Uh, how about $5 million? I was like, yes, absolutely. And then, of course, like as there's the negotiations, I don't know how the sausage is made, um, but their negotiations. We ended up with $1.6 million, which is super exciting. Um, but, of course, on a $17.5 million project, um, it's not enough to cover it. So we still had to do some borrowing, and we're still looking at all the couch pennies and all of that. Um, but another critical partner, you can see our governor there touring. I like getting pictures of all of them in our drinking water treatment facility. Um, so there he is touring. Um, that's probably the day that I said, can we ban PFAS from you being used in the state and produced? And he said, I like your spirit. And then, you know, we continued talking. 
Um, and <laughs> I do have audacity, and so during the budget process, I also wrote him like a 10 page paper where I was like, all right, we should proclaim water as a human right. You can do that, I know you can do that. And then we should also um, use $500 million of that you know, $6 billion over you know, uh, surplus that we have in the state and put that towards um, PFAS remediation. He's like, again, I really love your spirit. And he put in his executive budget $100 million for PFAS, which, okay, cool, awesome. Um, and then, strangely, what happened when the budget hit the legislature is they said, ah, we'd like to put $125 million towards PFAS. I was like, yes, great. So I'm showing up and I'm getting really excited. Um, one of the things I didn't realize about uh, the state budget process is that you could budget for something and then they could be like, well, you're not going to get that money just yet. We're going to send a trailer bill along to tell you how you can spend it. And so that, the budget being passed in July and signed, uh, great. We, we have $125 million dedicated towards PFAS remediation. But our partners in the legislature uh, have been bantering about how they exactly want to divvy up that money, um, how they want it to be spent. And um, they haven't quite landed on a solution yet. Uh, you may have heard Senate Bill 312, um, and that one is the one that is kind of be still being banter. I mean, I think the Senate's out of session now, so we might be SOL right now uh, for a little bit of time. Um, I will say the governor did make a request directly to the Joint Finance Committee twice now, um, asking to just release the funding, because they can do that. They can authorize the release of the funding. Um, so that communities like Wausau and anywhere else where they have PFAS could start applying for those funds. Um, no luck yet, uh, but there's still probably an opportunity there. Um, but that's going to be probably where I'll be spending my, my hours um, trying to advocate for that release of those funds. Um, I didn't mention here uh, yet that uh, the EPA was a really great partner. And again, I kind of went crazy reaching out to everybody. Like I'd wake up in the middle of the night and be like, who can I talk to about this? Well, the EPA has a local government ombudsman, and her job is to basically figure out who in the EPA I need to talk to in order to get my questions answered, um, to, you know, vent, uh, to rant about all the things. And actually, her husband is from Breedsburg, Wisconsin, which was really nice. It was a good in. Um, but I figured out who she was, and we have a really good, uh, we had a good conversation, and she got me in touch with the research and development folks at EPA, so they've reviewed all of our plans for our lead leg system. Um, and she also got me in touch because I, I'm a lot sometimes. And so now um, I, uh, the administrator, Reagan, of the EPA appointed me to the Local Government Advisory Committee, uh, which is great. I can sound off directly to the EPA on their policies, and I will tell you I have. Um, and then they're like, wow, we gotta wear this one out. And so they appointed me to be chair, co-chair of the Small Communities uh, advisory subcommittee. So um, spending some time getting to know my other community members on that. And it's been really great because there are other communities going through this. Um, maybe not necessarily in Wisconsin, but I met a mayor in Arkansas who's same thing. They have to build a granular activated system, super expensive. We talked about how much we've had to raise our rates. Wasa still might be a little bit more with between 60 and 65% of our rates went up to pay for this, uh, which is why we continue to um, I continue to try and find dollars uh, for this. So I guess the next slide was kind of where I thought about like what could people learn from this? What should you do if you discover that every single one of your wells is contaminated with PFAS? Well, first of all, understand your statutory and regulatory obligations. Um, that was one of the confusing things for me is that you know we were talking about 70 parts per trillion. Our highest well was 50 parts per trillion you would think, like, we're fine. Um, we're not, um, because the Department of Health Services says, hey, you know, actually, you shouldn't be consuming any of this. And they're actually going by some of the, the health advisory stuff, and they're basically saying close to nothing. You shouldn't be consuming PFAS. Um, so that was really what triggered our need to communicate this to our, our, um, our city, um, was the health, health, health advisory level. So, um, But also, opportunities for partnerships. Um, thankfully, we have great DNR folks, EPA, Department of Health Services. I listed off all of them. You all know who they are because they're here with us tonight. Um, and then communication was really um, difficult because A, you have to learn science. Um, 
as you heard in my background, I'm a philosopher and a communicator. I'm not necessarily a scientist. So I had people explaining to me over and over again how this stuff worked, what I needed to know, what the community needed to know. Um, but really it's important that you're first. Um, you need to continue communicating um, and you also need to bring your policymakers along. If you're an executive like I am, uh, bringing your policymakers along is really critical. Um, otherwise you might not be rowing in the same direction. Um, so we had some learning there to do. And then maybe the next slide, uh, what's next? We continue to participate in a variety of things. Um, we're involved, uh, when I say we, it's the utility and the city. Uh, we are in engaged in the multi-district litigation. You've probably heard about this against the manufacturers of PFAS, uh, DuPont, 3M, maybe 13 different um, manufacturers. So we've signed on to that. Um, and we're expecting a settlement in at least one of those cases pretty soon. And the cool thing is, is that it's uh, we submitted all of our um, the dollars that we've paid both um, to build our new drinking water treatment facility, to build the granular activated carbon, to um, give out those pitchers and bottled water, and um, you know that that equaled up to maybe sixty million dollars. Um, and so we turned that in, and we are going to end up getting. In theory, um, we're getting tens of millions of dollars once this set first settlement comes through, which I'm really excited about. It can't come soon enough. Um, it's really uh, exhausting to just keep asking our attorneys every day. Um, and so then, again, I'm kind of a lot. And so I was talking to our attorneys about this, and they said, have you thought maybe we should file something locally in your circuit court? Um, because this is really, I mean, this is profound um, how it's affected your community. And I said, well, tell me more, what do we have to do? And so uh, last year we filed a suit in Marathon County Circuit Court against all the manufacturers of PFAS um, and all of the insurers and kind of their subsidiaries. So lots of dozens and dozens of, of plaintiffs listed there. Um, we watched uh, Eau Claire do the same thing. The city of Eau Claire did that in their Eau Claire County Circuit Court and it immediately got punted out to the federal courts, to the multi-district litigation. Ours hasn't yet, ours is still there. So we might actually have, uh, have our opportunity to uh, talk to a jury of our peers about this, um, which is great because um, I have a lot to say and I'm sure a lot of our community members do too. And then of course, our $125 million trust fund. I was just on Capital City Sunday talking about why I need the, these dollars to, um, why I need these dollars right now uh, because we are spending so much money and basically our ratepayers and taxpayers are, are funding this um, even though they didn't do the pollution. And so that's the other thing we've been talking a lot. How do we talk about this? You know, we have 3M in our community. Um, they, they're great union jobs, you know, family supporting, um, but manufacturing PFAS has really damaged us. So how do we talk about this? Well, we're talking about the manufacturing. Um, and then, you know, we also discovered, um, I was interested in what you were calling, what did you call the drinking water treatment facilities that weren't public? They were something, T, T and C, T and C's. I didn't hear that term, but they tested theirs recently at 3M at the quarry. It's in the village of Maine. So it's just a bit north of Wausau. And um, they were at a combined of just two PFAS of like 520 parts per trillion. So obviously like that's a big deal. Um, and that's something that uh, we all care about uh, following up as a community. But after talking quickly, uh, I'm done here. So thank you. Um, and I'm ready for any question you want to throw at me. And I have questions for you all too. <laughs> thank you. You know, to Katie's point, it's really interesting. I spent a fair amount of time down at the Capitol. You know, there's that old saying, it's amazing how much you can get done when, you know, you don't have to take credit for it. And uh, it's interesting because we had numerous bills before the legislature in front of the governor. And, and I can tell you, sitting down there, it's a total impasse. They agree on everything, but nobody wants the other side to get credit for it. So nothing gets done. And it, it becomes very frustrating from our perspective. Uh, we're at a point in the program where you've heard some of these experts. And we'd like to allow some time for them to converse between themselves. Do any of you have any questions for the others back and forth conversationally? Because I'm going to have a whole bunch of questions for you when we get done here. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a couple uh, questions. First, uh, one for Katie and then one for you, uh, Melissa. Uh, Katie, have, have you folks identified an actual physical location that is the source of the uh, PFAS coming into the uh, Wausau Wells, if you are at liberty to say so? No. Um, and I say no. You know, we're working with the DNR with that. 
um, identifying that responsible party is how we call it. Um, so we have that. Thank you. And Melissa, uh, my question for you is, uh, you know, we go through cycles of polluting chemicals and then, uh, it, you know, it seems that usually um, comes a time where it's like, okay, we're going to stop making this, this, this stuff that's, that's causing a problem, blah, blah, blah. Do you see a time where we may be out of the woods on the PFAS issue? <clears throat> That's a great question, George, and I don't see a time anytime soon where we're out of the, out of the woods on PFAS. So if you recall, I, I said um, the 12 chain carbon fluorine, PFOA, PFOS have been phased out in the United States, again, still used in some parts of the world. Well, in all their amazing brilliance, they said, well, if we can't have a, a 12 chain, we're going to go with a 6 chain and call it Gen X and call it safe. So now Gen X is a contaminant of emerging concern in Michigan because it's showing up in, in the water wells and there are some health concerns with Gen X. Um, in other states, Vermont is one of them, they've uh, created an essential use law. Basically, is it essential to be used in all day makeup? Probably not, says the woman who doesn't wear makeup, so I guess it doesn't matter to me. But for some firefighting on complex fires in the um, semiconductor industry, there may be essential uses for it there, which means it's going to be continued to be produced. Interestingly, on the essential use law is more and more manufacturers are saying, wait a minute, <laughs> this is essential for us to make this product and they're asking for waivers. So I don't see any, in the 20 year horizon, I don't, I don't see it changing other than those long chain carbons being phased out. Um, but again, remember I said consumers, if you keep buying Teflon, guess what? They're gonna keep making Teflon pans. So if you have the wherewithal to buy stainless steel, carbon steel, cast iron, or buy it for friends who don't have those resources, that's how we start phasing them out. More and more responsible manufacturers are getting rid of PFAS. Do any of the others you have questions for what you had heard from the other expert panelists up here? Well, I got one of the questions answered already, but um, George, I was curious where I could find the data on those wells when you were talking about the nitrate. Is that on the website, your website? On the, UW. the the data on those, okay. uh, not the individuals, but the aggregated data is on the UWSP water. But like by community ish uh, site. What's that? By community, like I'd be able to say, oh, you live in Wild Rose. You can look down to the okay. to the section level there. If you need a custom run on something, um, you're gonna be my new BFF, I think. Sorry. Say again. <laughs> you're my new best friend. So oh, thank I'll just you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have enough. I'm gonna of be those. really annoying. But uh, Kevin, Kevin Masaryk likely would be able to churn out a custom run for you. Awesome, I'll twist you. his little arms if I need to. We have, in, we have a lot of questions here from from the group, and probably could get to some of those. I would be remiss though if I didn't. Um, we've had a couple of county board supervisors that have certainly been at the forefront of this since the water issues have really come to light in our area, and that's uh, Bill Lightnum who's responsible for this, Bill Clendenning, who's always there at every meeting, and then I have three, three other for sure that I see county board supervisors here. I have Dave LaFontaine, uh, Jay Kahn, and Joe Zerflu, and Joe's area down Port Edwards, town of Port Edwards area has uh, been somewhat affected by this. So all three of those are here, and they're all available if you ever need to contact them. Uh, we have a lot of questions here. Uh, one real interesting aside, uh, and Katie, you might have been in this meeting with me, but the local government institute uh, worked with a number of the universities, and it, this was an amazing fact to me. But when they looked at the patterns for in-migration over the next 30 to 50 years, they said the place that's going to have the most in-migration in the United States is Duluth, Minnesota. Now, I thought everybody left Duluth to go to Florida because it's too cold. And they said, well, you know, the interesting fact is they have predictable climate, it's cold. They are not, you know, real subject to natural disasters. You know, there's not a lot of earthquakes. There's no hurricanes. Uh, tornadic activity is far and few between. No volcanoes that we're aware of. Um, and they have what I would like to say kind of an unlimited supply of fresh water, unless we ruin it. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. So you might want to think about real estate in Duluth at some point. So we got a lot of questions here in front of us. And a lot of these are directed 
it, it seems to be towards uh, Dr. Kraft, but I'm going to let all you weigh in on these because we asked to put a name on top where you wanted these directed. Uh, one of the concerns I had when we talked to our water groups originally, uh, and I know uh, Supervisor Lightman would certainly back me up on this, I said, be careful in our Central Sands area, nitrates is of you know, primary concern when we started this before the PFAS issue came in. I said, that issue will somewhat get hijacked uh, by the legislature because large, large urban areas have more votes than small rural areas, just the way it works. They're all important, no matter what's polluting our groundwater, uh, but at the end of the day, we wanna keep an eye on all of those, not just one. So uh, I guess the first question, some of these aren't questions, some of these are statements, but uh, George, I guess the first question I gotta ask, and it was a pre pretty interesting one, uh, do you feel that uh, UW professors, uh, DNR specialists, and the rest have been encouraged to downplay the significance of water contamination in the state by, <laughs> whether it be the legislature, press, or somebody else. I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, any of you can answer this. It, just, it, it has your name on top of it. There, there's, a, there's a couple of things going on. Um, yeah, in the, in the past, there's a lot of professors. And, you know, we got academic free. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I got to back up a couple of steps. I was really bummed <laughs> about, you know, my job being threatened. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, am I doing the right thing? And... My dean, Christine Thomas, I don't know if you know this person, becoming an outdoors woman and all that, and I was down and I was kind of, and she, go, she goes, you are a University of Wisconsin tenured professor, and you got a job to do, and you get out there and do it. So I had that kind of backing uh, from my administration, not from the chancellor there, who was uh, uh, buddies with some uh, polluting interests. So, but there's other campuses where it's not that good, um, and, and people are, are afraid to speak up. The other thing is that a lot of times, uh, research professors in particular, they have relationships with, with the industry and they don't want to jeopardize those. And so uh, they, they don't do the broad kind of communication that I did. You know, I looked at all Wisconsinites supporting my position. I had a role, I was supposed to work with all of them. Uh, a lot of them don't feel the same way. They feel they want to, uh, they, they just work with the industry and not with everybody in the state that's, um, that, that's paying their salary. And I, I think that's a shame. Okay, and I'm gonna follow that up kind of directly back with you, George. And that was, the question was, do you think there's a probable solution to the nitrate problem uh, with ag in the Central Sands area, um, and yet maintaining the life of those people involved in ag? We do not have a short-term uh, solution here. As my, my farming buddy said, you know, we gotta talk about tackling this in the the Farm Bureau t and, and the, the way we do agriculture in the U.S. You know, there's all the talk, we got to feed the world, blah, blah, blah. If we really cared about feeding the world, we wouldn't be putting ethanol from corn in our gas tanks, right? We don't have a well agricultural uh, system here. We have to find a way to, to make this work. And I agree with my buddy that probably the Farm Bureau is where to start making this happen and start rewarding environmental performance with subsidies rather than just, just production. You know, 10 to 20% of farm income every year is from the federal government. Uh, we, could, we could change that up instead of you know, producing more, ratchet back your fertilizer applications somewhat, take a yield hit and get made whole again from, uh, from the subsidy programs. That's, that's my idea. We don't have something uh, on the horizon right now. The first thing I think is to recognize there's a problem, get the industry to recognize a problem, and let's start take, tackling it honestly by penciling things out, see what we can do. Thank you. Melissa? Thank you. Um, absolutely, trying to find sustainable solutions. Um, Wisconsin's Green Fire just received a partnership with Natural Resources Conservation Service, so Department of Ag, and we will be on, working on a two-year project called the Farm Sustainability Reward Program. And the idea is, is can we get farmers interested in um, greater sustainability in the retention of their soil? So cover crops, appropriate plantings. We don't want to lose our most important and most valuable resource, the soil. If you're farming, you know your most important resource is that soil. If you don't have it, you can't plant. If that soil has eroded away, either into a stream or river or gone to the four winds, you've just lost valuable nutrients and valuable money. So we're gonna be working in collaboration with Clean Wisconsin on that, um, that program. I'm hoping we get a few farmers 
that will be willing to work with us on developing this metric and seeing if this is a sustainable system of reducing nitrate um, runoff, um, increasing soil retention, and of course, byproduct would also be a carbon sink. So if we have cover crops all winter, they may help to um, absorb carbon from the atmosphere and impact uh, climate change in a positive way. Thanks. Katie, this one's going to kind of go to you. You touched on this already a little bit, but uh, the question was, instead of fighting endlessly about who will pick up the tab for PFA contamination, is there any proposal to ban them outright? And the answer is probably not, but there's some Not yet, <laughs> but if we all kind of come together, I mean, this is what I'm positing to the EPA. And, you know, there are a couple of experiments you're seeing in other states. So Minnesota and Maine, for instance, they have banned non-essential use. And... Um, it's very complicated. Um, so in Mi Minnesota, I think, is where they're kind of struggling, where they're not using it anymore in production, but the residues maybe are still on their paper-making machinery and things like that. So you're never going to get that 100% out. Um, and the other thing is, when I, I didn't mention this uh, because I'm still learning all the things about PFAS, but you know the way that we encounter it, it's 20% in your drinking water, and then 80% you're pretty much responsible for. So I don't know if you've seen the movie Dark Waters, but like that is me at 3 in the morning cleaning out all of the PFAS stuff in my life. I've been a vegetarian since I was 16, I think. I've started buying leather again because I don't want to have PFAS in my world. Um, so... We should ban it, yes, um, but it's going to take some time to get to a policy that we can actually um, accomplish together. And this kind of follows up on that. Has anyone looked at uh, bottled water? <laughs> I feel like Melissa should talk about this one. I don't know. I Here I am drinking out of my stainless steel thing because You're doing the nanoplastics really are driving me crazy, <laughs> but maybe you should talk about this. There are no um, sampling protocols for bottled water right now for PFAS, of course, for other contaminants, which I'm sure we can talk about, but PFAS, PFAS are not sampled for in bottled water currently. Uh, there was a study recently. Um, it was one of those kind of environmental groups where they kind of tested a bunch on their own. They spent the money, and I was shocked. And they even they tested sparkling water, so you might want to look that up if you're a sparkling water person, which I was. <laughs> All right, Ben, I'm going to go to you here. This is an interesting question, I thought. We know that PFAS are very persistent in the tissues of plants and animals, as well as humans. Are federal, state, and local health services thinking of any ways to decontaminate humans once <laughs> PFAS are detected within those systems? <laughs> uh, um, right now, there aren't any um, scientific studies as far as the human body decontaminating itself of PFAS. Um, I know th the most important thing that you can do is just pay attention to your diet um, and and other uses around the house um, right now. So. I have something to say about this. So um, I, there there are some interest organizations like firefighters who are actually studying um, a lot of this. And there was a study in it might have been last year in one of their firefighter international magazines about. Um, the PFAS level in blood, and they were testing firefighters' blood who'd been exposed to those foams. Um, and then when they uh, had plasma, I don't think they donated the plasma, but they pulled the plasma out, and then they tested again, and they found that it actually did lower the levels of PFAS in firefighter blood. And, and just to note, remember I said those long chains, the 12 chain PFOA, PFOA, PFOS have been phased out, I think it was 2000 or 2001. Um, since then, the blood serum of Americans for those two compounds has gone down significantly. So if we phase them out, if we avoid their consumption, again, we may end up doing that, you know, just being exposed. But the less exposure, the greater the opportunity to rid this stuff from your body. I'm sorry. I'm just going to follow up again. So the firefighter thing, um, we have it out of the foam. We don't use it in Wasa. We don't have it. And um, I was talking to our new chief, uh, deputy chief, who we stole from Wisconsin Rapids. Thank you. Um, and we were we'll talk, talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about the gear that firefighters wear. And I was like, I just, I don't want them to have PFAS on them. Like, how can we get this? And he's like, well, can we start with, like, they have special hoods that go underneath their helmets. Those are lined with PFAS. And I was like, okay, we're done. I'm not doing this anymore. We're not exposing. He's like, well, it's a little bit more expensive. I was like, I don't care. These firefighters are already exposed to carcinogens. Like, we're not going to just do it on purpose. So, One of the ones that's interesting is one, I'm certainly not an expert on any of these, uh, these issues specifically, but I get this question all the time. What can be done legislatively 
to address these issues uh, in drinking water? And the answer is vote. Vote. The answer is contact those people. You know, I can tell you one conversation with a legislator, whether it be at the state level or our congressional representatives, is worth a hundred letters. Uh, we pass resolutions every day on our county board floor that are, you know, they tend to get crumpled up and tossed in the garbage when they get down to Madison. And if you make the phone call or if you stop in the office and make an appointment, it's way more traction than you ever get by, um, you know, just sending form letters down there. So I'd say, Katie, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, again, it comes down to who gets credit. It amazes me when I sat down there and there was zero difference between the legislature and the governor's proposal on a lot of these clean water bills. And either both sides said, we're not going to give the other side credit. That's <laughs> yeah, I would say vote. Vote, vote, vote. It, gosh darn, it's the greatest thing about democracy. You get to, your voice can be shared, use it. But if you're having conversations, there's a few key things. If you wanna sit down and have a conversation with a legislator, number one, people shouldn't have to worry about diminished values of their property because of high nitrates. It just should not happen. Have those conversations, ask them, do you think my neighbors well should be contaminated with nitrates and their house be or their home value be diminished? Ask the question. As it relates to PFAS, we need a funding bill for that 125 million, unless joint finance gets their act together. And then we need other, we need groundwater standards, we need biosolid standards, we need cleanup standards. Ask them to don't put them in a massive omnibus bill, which is complicated. Ask them to parse it out individually so we can move these through the process. You know, and there's kind of a follow-up to that. It's, you know, why don't local governments do more? And it's generally because the state is not going to cede power to local governments. That happens for elections, but uh, they tend to, if they have control, they tend to keep control, uh, which does take away some of that local authority and regulation, which would be extremely beneficial. Um, this is a question that guy, it's a long question. It was typed out. I didn't want to ask it because I was afraid I'd pronounce it wrong, but the question was this. I would like one of the panelists to please speak on the Neonic Imid Decloprid. <laughs> Imid Decloprid problem. Particularly the fact that it's used in seed coatings on vegetable seeds sold to farmers. It has a health advisory level of 0.2 micrograms per liter, which is like a grain of sand in a quart of water. Because it's very water soluble, it can be taken in by plants we eat or by water we drink, which is contaminated. Has there been any testing or studies showing how much of it is taken in by plants and so how much of that we might ingest? Ah. Any ideas? Yeah. Uh, I don't have this on the tip of my tongue, but. I can't even pronounce it, but you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and not, without, not without being yeah. able to read it, I, yeah, I, I did. won't it's be able to. It's in the So there's. A, <laughs> There are a class of uh, insecticides call, uh, called neonicotinoids because they have some similarities with, uh, with the structure of uh, nicotine. Imidacloprid, thank you. Um, and and there, there's, a, there's a family of these things, imidacloprid being only, only one of them. So the state survey showed that 5.4% uh, of wells in Wisconsin had these neonicotinoid uh, insecticides in them. Um, the incidence of uh, the neonicotinoid uh, pesticides were higher in the central sands than even other parts of agricultural Wisconsin. Uh, and the hypothesis is that it's be because they're uh, more commonly used uh, not only as a seed coating, but also in um, uh, to, to fight against insects in, in potato crops. I think that's, uh, I, I haven't seen that speculation confirmed at this point. Uh, and so I, I forget what the exact number in the central sands, uh, central Wisconsin actually of, of wells, uh, but it's more than the 5.4% state average. Um, what's really concerning about this, even it seems to be more than the, uh, the effect on human health is that there's a, a fellow in uh, my group at UW Stevens Point, there's a fellow at the College of Ag and Life Sciences that have, attract, have tracked this stuff. So not only is it getting from fields to groundwater, but it's getting from groundwater streams and it's showing up in, stre in streams in concentrations that might be high enough to kill aquatic invertebrates. In other words, aquatic insects that are the, the base of the food chain there. 
Um, there's concern that there's going to be a buildup over, over time uh, where more and more of these in the groundwater and they're going to be showing up in the streams with pot potential ecological effects. That's all I could say right now. Um, I, I, I wish I remembered more. Okay, well, I'll just keep following up here till we run out of time. We got a few more here. Uh, it says more than 10,000 acres in central Wisconsin are being uh, proposed to be converted from irrigated ag to utility solar. Uh, pumping, wind, and soil erosion will be reduced, but the hydrology will be affected. Is there a way to calculate this pumping conversion? The question actually followed, will the Buena Vista wildlife area convert to a tamarack swamp once again? Will we need drainage um, ditches? Yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> uh, question. I've scratched my head on it quite a, quite a bit. So You didn't ask this question, did you? I did not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also happen to be on the Portage County Drainage District Board right now through a weird set of circumstances. Um, and, and so we would expect that uh, you know, putting up soil or pan solar panels are going to absor absorb sunlight. That's uh, energy that's not available to evaporate water. Not 100 percent, but you know, it, it's going to uh, cut down the amount of uh, evapotranspiration that we would see. Uh, I don't expect that we are going to see significant groundwater rise that would uh, change the makeup of the uh, uh, the the wild plants and, and and things that go along with it. But I haven't totally crunched the numbers. It, it's something that could be done. Um, but to my knowledge, no one has. Okay. I'm going to roll these together because they all have the same handwriting. So I have a feeling the same person probably wrote these. But uh, the question was, the problem of manure and water is decades old. Self-reporting manure lagoons and nutrient management plans are not working. Uh, contamination is increasing. Taxpayers uh, are on the hook. Their wells are followed up. You know, how should we proceed? And then that was followed up with... Um, how do you feel about helping farmers dehydrate their manure so that farmers can do away with leaky lagoons, contaminant systems, and perhaps uh, sell the excess in dehydrated farms uh, in that in de dehydrated form uh, to the public? Now, I don't know if that's something you've ever looked into, if that's a process that we're currently using. A little bit? A little bit. And so I, I know there are uh, dairies in the Twin Cities that this was their method of manure uh, management. They, they were composting manure more so than... Um, uh, dehydrating it uh, and, and then selling it to landscaping houses and that sort of thing. Um, I th my recollection is that they were representing that uh, this was something that was just barely economical and you know would be difficult to do, especially if we're talking smaller scale kind of uh, dairy operations. Okay. Melissa, I think you had a comment. Um, there's a farmer in Portage County, uh, Filt's Family Farm, um, and they do windrow composting of manure. Um, I don't know how economical it is if he's making money on it, but it's the first that I know of in Portage County to do windrow composting of manure rather than just straight land applying it. Of course, he's using the nutrients in the sandy soil, but I did buy some from him last year because he had excess, and it's now in my flower bed. So... There are ways to manage manure outside of great big slurry pits. So, and they're relatively, you know, moderately sized farm. Katie, do you have something over is, there too? Oh, is this is this the fellow that's just off of I thirty nine, or is it okay? Thank you. So we also, uh, and I haven't been involved in any of the discussions because I'm letting county board do county board things, but I have been reading about it, and we have a farm in Marathon County that is getting a large, large grant for a dehydrator to do just that. Um, and it looks like it's an interesting deal, but I don't, I don't know all the technicalities of it. And this is kind of a follow-up to that, too. It says, our farmers are scolded for manure uh, in the neighbor's well, or the contamination they're from, uh, and they've turned to cheap sludge to fertilize their crops. But sludge is full of PFAS, and the crops uh, that they grow we're eating. Is there any way they can filter PFAS out of sludge, and how? Well, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little preview, um, because since we started filtering our drinking water, um, and we've started, we've tested our wastewater, we're seeing that it's getting, it's leaving the system. So our, the PFAS in our wastewater is now going down as well, which is good because we still have farmers who want to buy that sludge to uh, land spread and all of that. So we've had some dark nights of the soul discussing these things. Um, but getting it out of the drinking water um, is step one. I think there might be some other opportunities that other experts might actually know about. 
I had one here, it's more of a comment, but it just says on a positive note, uh, DATCAP reports that since 2016, one million acres of ag production land has been converted into no-till cover crops um, out of 14 million acres. There's 48 farmer-led uh, councils and coalitions across the state uh, that are championing these no-till efforts. And I know we do a lot of that in Wood County. We actually have uh, a grain drill that we rent out to farmers to proceed in that direction. This was a really interesting question. Um, and by the way, some of these are a little tough to read because of the way they were written, <laughs> well, the handwriting. It says, we know that industrial hemp, which is not a psychotic, uh, would be a great uh, sacrificial crop on uh, the low end of a parcel to sop up excessive nitrates and prevent contamination of our lakes and streams. Uh, could farmers be allowed to grow hemp without restrictions? I don't know that we have any... <laughs> All right, we're pro-hemp, I guess, today yeah. on, on that issue. Yeah, pro-hemp, I don't care. <laughs> All right. um, here's one, the industrial impacts. Um, the industrial pollution from upstream impacts, obviously, not only our groundwater, but our surface waters. Um, is there anything that we can do to work better uh, with those industrial entities uh, to help clean our lakes, to better our local economy? and to move in a positive direction. I paraphrase that a little bit. I feel like you're looking at me. I am. Um, <laughs> well, and I think part of it is having these conversations, right? Like having thoughtful conversations that were not under the glare of light and like be not being televised. Um, but I'm gonna share a story with you that's kind of adjacent related, but I don't know. Um, and it's my hope for the future of corporate interactions with government. Um, last year I went to Germany and because I'm a weird tourist, I went to a steel manufacturing plant in Saarland. And um, what they were doing there was the, the union steel makers there had proposed an idea to convert uh, from coal manufacturing of steel to hydrogen, and they were pushing this. I think it's like a $3 billion project, um, which worked out for them because they have a lot of COVID era recovery funds. And so they lobbied their local um, you know, governor of Saarland and they said, we wanna do this. And they were like, wow, you guys really have thought through this. This is incredible. We would support you using these COVID era recovery funds. Let's get it done. And so then they lobbied the, gover the government of Germany. And you know they had all kinds of demonstrations. Like These are the union guys. They had 12,000 union guys marching in the streets saying, we want to convert to green steel as the future. This is how we're going to get it done. And Germany was like, heck yes, let's go. We just need holy water from the EU now. Um, and so they're getting it done. They had a couple of court cases. You know, Can we use these funds, whatever. But having industry leading that conversation in such a productive way, they were fighting for the future of their community. And so we need our businesses to fight for the future of our community um, so that our resources aren't used up. And I think that's the perfect example of how industry can support this. Um, maybe I'm just a little too optimistic thinking that could happen here, but I, I don't know. I'm seeing a lot of union activity and I think there's opportunity to have really powerful conversations like that. I think as far as water goes, uh, okay, I guess I'm old. I can remember this. The Clean Water Act was passed 52 years ago. Uh, I got pictures from a friend in the Wisconsin River with a sludge uh, on the Rhinelander flowage. Uh, rodents could run back and forth across the river if there was that much crap in it. Uh, fishing, forget it. Uh, it you know, and here we are, Wisconsin Rapids, right? The home of back in the day of consolidated papers. Um, did an amazing job. This river is fishable, it's swimmable. Uh, pe people recreated it. The Fox River uh, has gotten a lot better because we took out all the point sources for the most part. In fact, it's almost impossible to squeeze any more pollution um, out of industrial uh, uh, discharges anymore. So we, we, I think we got to give them uh, some credit for really stepping up to the the uh, table starting in 1972 and uh, getting the solids out of the water, getting the biological oxygen demand out of there, getting the phosphorus out, out of there. Uh, they can't, in the, the heck of a problem, you know, in the discharge of Green Bay with the dead zone there, the point sources can't take it any, any more out there. There's, uh, there's barely any phosphorus in there. and. Um, you know, j just can't squeeze it out. We got to get on the non-point issue on that, the stuff that's coming out of agricultural land. I love that story, Katie. I have more. 
I know you do. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll drink and have those discussions. Um, after they kick us out of the after library. After they kick us out of the library. Um, now, my work with Green Fire, I do a lot of work with legislators, and my, uh, I have a policy team, a legislative policy team. And as we start looking at all kinds of um, uh, bills that may come our way, or even uh, some of our priorities, very frequently when we begin those discussions, the question we ask ourselves is, Will Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce get in the way of this? They're a powerful lobby, and, and they don't represent all industry, and I think that's the problem. I think, like George says, we have so many folks in Wisconsin, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, even some big businesses, who really want to do the right thing, so we need to elevate their voices and minimize the voices of Wisconsin Manufacturer and Commerce because they stand in the way of the kind of progress that we need on the environment and on conservation. Thanks, and we are really running out of time tonight. Uh, I guess at this time, first thing I'd like to do is, uh, I'm gonna recognize Bill, Bill Lightnum. Bill really spearheaded the Citizens Water Group. <laughs> and, and they have really taken the bull by the horns. Uh, like I said, he along with Bill Clendenning at the start of this were there maybe when nobody else was. And uh, they've taken it to this point. They've certainly brought awareness uh, of the issue to Central Wisconsin. And I want to thank the group out here, too, uh, for their attention and uh, the way they handled tonight's event. And Bill, I'm going to turn this over to you to wrap this up. And thank you. Thank you. Sir. Bruce, can you cue that what's next slide? While Bruce is doing that, it's really interesting. Um, the people that you've been listening to for the past two plus hours, Katie had a what ne what's next slide up too. So while we're, there we go. Um, so I don't have to say this to you because you're good people who are interested in this, but continue to educate yourself. It was there for a minute. Continue educating yourself. Talk to those legislators Talk to people from joint finance. Talk to your natural resources board. Lance said that to you. You, you need to actually do FaceTime with these people. Maybe, maybe the slide's not going to come up again. And then Katie said the other thing, vote. Go to Wisconsin conservation voters and find out who's got a 100% voting record on environmental issues. Find out who's got a 0% voting record. Vote for those people. That's the only way anything's going to get done. Um, I'd like to put a plug in for Citizens Water Group. Um, join us. We meet the third Mondays of each month at the River Block Building at 2 o'clock. Um, join the League of Women Voters. Join Clean Green Action, the people that we're putting on this evening for you. Um, we, we need membership. We need your help. We need to fill a room like this. Um, look for us, look for uh, Citizens Water Group on Facebook, we're there. Look for Clean Green Action and the League of Women Voters. Uh, you can see that on the slide that you're there. You're out of here in 30 seconds. So I need to do a couple thank yous other than the ones that Lance did. Um, would you please hold your applause um, till we're finished? But you're out of here in 25 seconds now. To our moderator, and our four panelists, hold your applause. Thank you, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we didn't pay them. They came here because they believe in this issue. <laughs> well, sorry. Um, thank you to McMillan Library, to Catherine Elkert and her um, staff, to Colin up in the booth up there. Thank you. And then there's some special people. The subcommittee that put this on for you tonight Bruce Deming, up in the booth. Thank you, Bruce. Rhonda Carell, our secretary. Thank you so much. This was four months in the making. Bill Clendenning with County Board. Thank you, Bill. Um, Gordy Gottbeheat. Most of these people are in the back row over here. Ken Winters, uh, Cecile Johnson. They're the people that put this program on tonight. Thanks to Joe Ansel and Clean Green Action, Mary Dom and the League of Women Voters. But most of all, folks, thank you to you. Thank you for being here. Big round of applause for yourselves. Good evening. Thanks for coming. <laughs>